What's up, y'all, and welcome into the Jack Vita Show. I'm your host, as always, Jack Vita, and I'm back after really not doing a whole lot of podcasts over the last few weeks. I was out in Phoenix. I didn't record a single episode while I was out there. I was out there for two and a half weeks, and I did, while I was out there, we did. I did release an episode that I recorded right before Thanksgiving. So the last couple episodes, if you guys are interested... Um, I spoke with Stephanie LaGrosa Kendrick, of course, from Survivor, and she's been on this show several times. And we interviewed her nephew, Philip, who's a Little League All-Star. It was a great time. It was adorable. You guys will check, should check it out. It's a really fun time. We talked a lot of baseball, uh, youth sports. Here you can hear about uh, Stephanie, one of her embarrassing uh, sports stories from her athletic career. I told one of mine. So that was a lot of fun. And the episode before that... We spoke with Dr. Sean Kniff from the first ever season of Survivor. And I want to I want to show you something here. By the way, I got joining me today is Ryan Packett, who's returning to the show. Uh, of course, he always contributes a lot with college basketball, but also some Major League Baseball stuff as well. Huge Reds fan. Uh, we welcome him in. Ryan, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Always, uh, always a good time. It's great to have you here. So I want to show you something that Dr. Sean actually sent me this in the mail. If you can see this, this is a product that he invented. It's the Jerk at Work doll. So basically the idea behind it is you pull a prank on somebody and you leave the jerk there. And it was the jerk and it's kind of you pass it around the office type thing. So he was kind enough to mail me one of these. Just came in the mail the other day. Uh, so check it out. Go to the jerk at work dot com. Did you know he was so inventive? Uh, I I figured um, if we go back to soup, <laughs> what Super Bowl? Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> that's a uh, yeah. I didn't expect anything like that though. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. And also, uh, we're we're brought to you today by Paramount Plus. If you guys want to watch any season of Survivor, Big Brother, The Challenge on MTV. The Amazing Race, go to jackvita.com slash Paramount. Today we are talking MLB free agency. Like I said, I haven't gotten a chance to talk sports on this show in almost over, it's been probably over a month at this point. Um, Been pretty busy, but we've had a lot of action over the uh, MLB offseason, especially over the last couple weeks since the start of the winter meetings. You guys can catch it all at Fastball on Sports Illustrated Fan Nation, si.com slash fan nation slash MLB slash fastball. I'm the lead writer over there. We've had a lot to discuss in terms of the offseason today. We're going to kind of catch you guys up on some of it and provide some analysis as well. Um, Really the big thing, by the way, we're three days before Christmas. So this is my Christmas gift to all of you that are listening. I'm back. We've got a podcast. We'll have more coming soon. Um, but the, the big news of this week is Carlos Correa. Carlos Correa was apparently, it seemed he was going to play his next 13 years to the San Francisco Giants. He had agreed to terms on a $350 million contract spread across 13 years that would pay him up till he was 41 years old. Now that is not He will not be playing for the Giants. He instead will be playing for the New York Mets. That deal originally was reported on about 10 days ago. And then on Tuesday, he was supposed to have his introductory press conference to and face the San Francisco in national media for the first time as a member of the Giants. Uh, We got some news from the Associated Press sometime in the afternoon that his press conference would be delayed because of a medical concern that showed up on his physical. And then we didn't hear anything until about 12 hours later in the middle of the night, John Heyman reporting that Carlos Correa will be a member of the New York Mets. That deal with the Giants fell apart. We don't entirely know what happened there, but Scott Boris worked out a deal in the middle of the night at the 11th hour with Steve Cohen, and now Correa will join the Mets on a 12-year, $315 million contract. So he's going to lose, he's going to get about $45 million less. So instead of having the fourth highest paid contract in baseball history, he will have the fifth 
biggest contract in baseball history. He's still going to make a lot of money. Ryan, what do you think happened here? What 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 do we make of all this? Well, what I don't know if you've heard this, but what I've heard is something about a foot injury retroactive back to 2014. That's the issue here. Have you heard that? So I have not heard that, although, however, I have not spoken to anyone uh, directly or I don't have any sources in this. What I had heard, however, was uh, about three weeks ago, Buster only reported that teams he had spoken to executives that were hesitant to sign Correa to a long term contract because they had concerns about his lower back. So it's entirely possible that it's not just the lower back. It could be a foot injury as well this is a player that has been on the injured list or the prior previously known as a uh, the dl uh <laughs> he the disabled list um seven times in his eight-year career so this is a guy who's been injured a lot he's only played 111 or more games in three of his eight seasons so it would not shock me if it's not just the lower back and it is in fact something else yeah, there's there's two sides with uh, Carlos Correa. There's no denying what he does on the field when he's healthy. He's one of the best at his position uh, as, over the past almost 10 years, you know, seven or eight years. However, there's significant injury history that you have to take into consideration when you're handing out a 12 or 13 year contract in the $300 million range. So there's, uh, I think you can definitely call this a high risk high reward move and uh i don't know it'll it, obviously a lot of this is going to ride on injury history and how he ages but this could end up being really bad or you know maybe this will be what the mets need for the next two or three years that puts him over the top so correa is expected to play third base with lindor who's also from puerto rico they're both from the native same native country he's going to remain at shortstop and Lindor got a massive contract two years ago from that team after they traded for him. They extended him. And we'll get into some of the Mets stuff in a second. Do you think that this was, in fact, a situation where they saw something on the physical, the Giants didn't feel comfortable, and they withdrew their offer? Is that what you think happened? Yeah, I think, and I think it was a good move. I actually, I'm going to call this one a win-win for both teams. I'm going to say it's good for the Giants because I don't think Carlos Correa was putting them over the top, especially in that division right now. Even with Carlos Correa, I don't think they're within 10 wins of either the Padres or the Dodgers. Of course, with the sixth playoff spot being added, there's possibilities they could sneak their way in. We just saw that the fifth and sixth seeds in the Padres and the Phillies respectively made the NL championship series. So, you know, how much does the regular season matter as long as you make it to the playoffs? You can debate that. But I don't think with Carlos Correa, they're a playoff team. So I think it's probably better for them and better for their future. Obviously, they're going to be – they're not going to be as good without him. But – and then on the flip side, with the amount of money that, the that you know, Cohen and the Mets are throwing out there – why not? <laughs> Why not? Um, I I don't really think money matters much to them. So obviously Correa, if he's on the field, makes them better. You know, he's going to plug right into the middle of that lineup. He's going to play third base. And uh, I think, you know, the Mets are, they got to be one of the teams to beat, right? Oh, 100% with or without Correa. And, We'll get more into the Mets stuff in a second, but the thing with the Giants is I was reading over the summer, I read the Game of Shadows book about Barry Bonds' PED usage and all that was reported on in that book, and it's a very good book. And one of the things that I found very interesting is that the club was really trying to, at the time, they the owner needed to have a marquee star. And that's why he signed Barry Bonds at the time to the largest contract in baseball history and made a lot of decisions from that point forward that may have not may not have benefited the club. He chose Dusty. He chose Bonds over Dusty Baker and Jeff Kent, who had more respect from the clubhouse. But 
you know what the thing with uh with Bonds was making he was making him a lot of money. And I think the Giants for the last few years, going back to Bryce Harper's free agency, which is hard to believe that was four years ago, the Giants have been trying to find that type of player. Now, obviously, None of these guys are Barry Bonds because when Barry Bonds was at his peak, we had never seen a hitter like that before. Um, And you can say what you want to about how he played the game and and whatnot, but that's besides the point. The Giants are looking for some kind of face of the franchise, sell tickets. That's what this move is about. They missed out on Bryce Harper. They missed out on Aaron Judge. There have been a couple other guys in between that they have been linked to that they didn't end up getting to sign. And there were a lot of people that were saying, do people actually want to, these guys actually want to go play for the Giants? What's up with this organization? So I actually think that what you're saying is there's, you, it carries a lot of merit because they, they got a guy to agree. They showed the fans, hey, we can, we have the money. We can get a guy to it. We're, we're willing to pony that up. We're willing to bring in a guy to our organization And we'll talk more about Correa in a second, but I don't think that that was a very good baseball investment. So I thought it was a pretty, you know, obviously I know some fans are probably going to be a little disappointed right now, but I think in a couple of years, fans are going to be looking at this as a blessing in disguise. I couldn't agree more. I was curious myself what Giants fans were thinking. So I meandered onto uh, San Francisco Giants Reddit last night. Wow. Uh, no, no. <laughs> they are not thinking along the lines of you. They are. <laughs> there were people. There were like, and I'm not. I'm not saying like there were two or three people. I had to search to find positive comments. Like it is. That's bad. also the internet. People aren't positive on the internet. Well, yeah, but this was overwhelming. Like this was like yeah. extra for even the internet, and it was like <laughs> overwhelmingly people posting the phone number to turn in like season tickets and stuff wow. like that. And like this is the, the they think almost like they're looking at this Korea thing of like, you know, you fool me once, shame on you. You fool me twice, shame on me. Like. They see this almost as like they've saw this before and they're like, this is this is always going to keep happening. We're never, you know, we're uh, we're never going to be we're never going to be the guy like it's never going to happen. And I thought I was on the red subreddit for last night when I was looking at them, like complaining about not showing (laughs) out enough money. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, (laughs) yeah. So I guess it's in the eye of the beholder. But and then in addition to that. I just thought of this myself. Would you compare the Giants signing Correa to the Padres signing Machado three or four years ago? Not at all. I would not at all because I think Machado is an elite player. And we're going to get – well, I'll bring it up right now. Carlos Correa, I tweeted this out just minutes ago. He. This is what, what fascinates me. Let me ask you this real quick before I get into it. Two years ago, when he was approaching free agency, did you ever at any point think of Carlos Correa as this superstar, uh, elite top 10 type player, which apparently seems to be the perspective by a lot of fans now? Um, the fringe, you know, if he was healthy all the time, yes, I would. He has, he has that postseason success. You know, that a lot of people don't have. All right. So I did not think of him in that regard. I thought if you were talking, I think it was like a couple years ago, you just kind of talked about him in a batch of a lot of young, good shortstops. And I think really the guys that it's funny, it changes like two years ago, people didn't think Javi Baez was what people think of Javi Baez now. Um, and I was, there are a lot of people who, who have stayed pretty consistent. I was one of those people. I wrote the piece a couple years ago about why the Cubs should trade Baez instead of extending him. But I think like I, Correa was just, I don't remember him being talked about the way that he's being regarded as now. I think Scott Boris has done a remarkable job in branding him, marketing him as an agent. He played exceptionally well especially over the last two years in both contract years. But again, like coming into coming into two years ago, 
he had only played one season of 111 games or more. He's only had, I tweeted this out just a few minutes ago, as I mentioned, eight years in the big leagues, one season where he's finished top 15 in American League MVP voting. So only once in his career has he been a de facto top 15 player in his league. Machado is a guy that you're looking at can be an MVP candidate year in and year out in whichever league he plays in, which is what we've, you know, we've seen him in, in the American League and in the National League. So to me, the last year where people have been talking about this guy as a potential $300 million signing, which he got more than that, he got the most money out of all these guys. Um, and, you know, we can talk, we'll talk more about the other guys, but to me, I, I still am a, a little bit surprised that the narrative has really changed quite a bit um, really in less than two years. Do you think that the Mets really care what he does during the regular season? Uh, that's a good question. I think, yes, yeah, so this is a good point. Let's transition into the Mets side of things. So the Mets right now, as you mentioned, they're just going all in. They're spending like crazy. And you know what's funny is a lot of times when teams do this, I'm I'm very critical. I'm very critical of the contracts. I'm very critical of the years. I'm very critical of this kind of roster building idea of just assembling pieces. Like I personally don't think the Phillies are going to go back to the World Series next year. I think they caught lightning in a bottle. I don't think the Padres are going to win the National League. But I have to say the Mets, I think the Mets are a much better team than both of them, in all honesty, because I think they've done a, a very good job of identifying and assembling. A, like last year, they had a great team up until really the end of the season, and they just kind of ran out of gas. I think that Atlanta catching up to them really took the wind out of their sails. But based on before this signing, one of the things I liked about them also is they – put the ball in play a lot. They're a good contact hitting team. I think they've gotten better defensively, especially from where they were two years ago. And I also think they upgraded their pitching staff, believe it or not. I think their pitching is much better than it was a year ago. So with or without Correa, like you said, if he only plays 110 games this season, they're, they're still going to win a lot. Now, I, th I mean, that, that National League East race is going to be very close. But like you talk about with the Phillies, the Mets, their mentality, I don't know if it's, hey, we, I don't know how much emphasis they're putting on winning that division or if they're looking at Correa as that extra piece to help them win the division or if it is like you talk about postseason performance and having just a juggernaut going into the postseason. Yeah, I think it's a postseason move. Um I could see the Mets take a Dodgers of like what 2019 approach of you know putting pitchers on the Phantom IL, like making sure that Verlander and Scherzer are healthy going into the postseason is really all that matters. The Mets, I, I don't see a world where they don't finish with a top six record in the NL this year. Like I don't see that happen. Yeah, that that be ridiculous They're, yeah now and they also the other thing but, they have the manager too buck does a group buck is like the right manager leading that club yeah absolutely and but the problem is if they want to win the division which we've we've seen you know if, if you don't win the division you're playing in a three-game series now instead of a five-game series which higher variance you know they just lost a three-game series to the padres so that's a sour taste in their mouth if they kind of limp through the regular season and are giving guys time off and yada yada, they could lose to the Braves again. You know, the Braves could go out there and win. You know, I don't know if they're going to win 100 again, but I would definitely be surprised if they're not in the at least 93-94 win range. So I think, the, I think the Braves, I still would pick the Braves to win the division again, personally. Why? Why? Yeah. They've won it five years in a row. And they like part of it isn't just like I'm that, that's something where I would kind of chalk up to the synergy of a club like these guys came up through the farm system together a lot of them and I think that plays a factor like I remember watching that Derek Jeter series over the summer and I can't remember who was saying it maybe it was Joe Torre 
they're talking about how the Yankees had this when they won all those championships in the late nineties, those were a lot of guys who came up through the farm system together. It was a big part of their team chemistry. And then they abandoned that model and went through this kind of like, we're going to buy every player type thing. And we're going to have all these mercenaries. And I just favor that approach of, I think the Braves now have their core locked up for the next several years. And I think the Braves are going to keep, I I think they're going to win the division again this year. I think you also make a good point about, you know, are you, how much is, how many games are you going to have Verlander pitch? How many games are you going to have Scherzer pitch as good as the Mets are? And then the other thing, I give them the psychological edge. I give them that mental edge because going into that final series, that was something that honestly did not shock me that the Braves needed to win all three of those games. And they said, you know what? We own this division. We own you guys. And they did it again. Now, I know that that's going to fire something up in this Mets clubhouse. I know Buck's probably going to use that all winter for this Mets team. I think it's probably going to be a photo finish again. But I would favor the Braves just because of those mentioned, those three, those three or four things that I just mentioned. And on top of how much are you going to have Verlander pitch, how much are you going to have Scherzer pitch, at the risk of pronouncing his name wrong, do you know how to pronounce the guy they signed from Japan? Kodai Senga. Okay, so Kodai Senga, his career high innings pitched is 144. Wow. So, and the the thing is, like, there's no denying his stuff. Like, he's got a fastball that has touched 102. He sits at, like, 97. He has a really nice slider. His... Go to pitch fork. though is the ghost fork. Yeah, it's like a um, it's I guess you'd almost call it as like a slower splitter, I guess, because it's definitely more than a changeup. It breaks away from the his throwing hand, so it breaks in towards righties because he's a righty, and um, so it's kind of got like that splitter action, but it's slower. Those are really his those are like his three pitches and he has command problems though and i i've read that his he tends to hang his slider a lot so he might not get away with what he does you know in a a superior baseball league i guess you'd say in america i don't yeah i mean obviously the japanese league's very good too but i mean people come here for a reason like, this is the best baseball league in the world I, I think people would agree to that um his so he he plays more like a you know he sounds like a five inning guy. So yeah. you got three guys, you know, their three best pitchers are, well, obviously two of them and Verlander and Scherzer are very established. You like what you're seeing from this new guy from Japan, but. And I mean, you, you know, can are also they make ha- the case that Jose Quintana, who they just paid a nice sum of money to, you know, he, his career dropped off for a couple of years there with the Cubs and then with the pirates. And then last year he had a nice resurgent year. So you can't, Necessary. It's not like a lock that you're gonna get what you got at Quintana a year ago, right? Quintana's not gonna be pitching with the same defense behind him that he had in St. Yeah. Louis. Um, I I think it'd be um, irresponsible to assume that he's gonna perform as well this year as he did last year. Last year seemed like more of an outlier over the last you know five years of his career. Um, you know he'll be solid, but I don't I don't think he's someone you're you know, stoked to see run out there to win a playoff game for you. But And meanwhile, you get the, the Braves get hopefully a healthy Acuna. They get Albies back. So there are reasons why the Braves could, yes, you lose Swanson and you're going to lose a little bit of leadership there. I think they're probably going to make another move. I think the Murphy move was kind of like the replacement for Swanson in a weird way. I think they went with, you know what, we're probably going to lose this guy. I th- it was interesting that they made that trade at that time. I think they were anticipating they're going to lose him. So they brought in a great defensive catcher who has a good bat. Um, and maybe they like some leadership qualities in him too. So now they've dealt with the A's a couple times. They brought over Matt Olson. Now they bring over Sean Murphy. Uh, what would you think of that trade, by the way? Seems like a massive win for the Brewers, honestly. <laughs> yeah. They didn't really give up much. I mean, they gave up one, you know, prospect, and they bring in a, uh, they bring in Contreras, um, you know, Wilson's brother William, and uh, it seems like a big win for them. I would also, I think that the Braves come out better from that trade. Also, you know, Oakland, you know, we'll see what happens. Obviously, they, you know, they yeah. they got to stock up on young people. They're they're not doing anything anytime soon. So. 
Yeah. So anyway, going back to the Mets, like you said, there are a lot of things that you can't just say that's a slam dunk to win the division. Um, but they are a team that, like you said, it's. It, I would be totally shocked if they're not in that top six. And I, I mean, truly, I think you're probably going to see another situation like last year where it might take 101 games, 103 games to win this division. And I, I personally don't think Philly's going to be as close with those two teams as Philly might think that it will be. Do you, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but – is it fair or would you agree that you could write the Mets, Braves, and Penn for the postseason, the Dodgers, Padres, and Penn for the postseason, and then you're going to have the winner in the NL Central, and then there's going to be you know three or four teams com- competing for that final I think you could write the Cardinals and Penn in right now. I don't, I don't see any of those teams in the Central competing with the Cardinals. I think the Cardinals should be making moves not based on how do we win the division because I think the division is going to be I think it's going to be a slam dunk unless I don't know unless someone can really surprise I don't know if that team could be Pittsburgh if they arrived a year early or if it was you know if the Brewers have something in their advanced analytics department they're doing something that they really like but I think personally I think the Cardinals are going to win that division and I don't think it should be very hard for them I think the Cardinals should be making decisions based on how do we leap past Atlanta, New York, mm-hmm. Los Angeles, San Diego. Yeah, and the Cardinals' like entire rotation almost is like this is their last year. So, also like you know, Goldschmidt's not getting any younger. Arenado's not getting any younger. It's Wayne Wright's well, last year. Oh, you got two great years out of both of them last year. And you said last year oh, coming yeah. into the year, you were like, I don't think Goldschmidt's going to do what he did last year, and he was even better. So Right, right. Take that. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I think that, you know, the Cardinals can probably win the division with like 87 wins, I think. Yeah, they could. I think they'll win more than that. But, they, yeah. So, anyway, yeah, no, you I'm were saying, saying like, though. So you're saying you like you think you can pencil in or pen in those top two teams in the NL East, top two in the NL West, and then uh, the Central champ Cardinals, and then what were you gonna say after that? Three or four teams competing for that final spot. Philly, and who who else? Maybe Milwaukee. Maybe maybe Chicago. No chance. I think the Cubs. I mean, I think the Cubs right now look like a team that could, you know, maybe they're around 81 wins. Um, I think what's going to happen with the Cubs is they're what the Cubs are doing is they signed a lot of guys to short term contracts. So they're in a situation where they're going to look like they can compete and then they get close to the trade deadline. I think they actually will move some of those guys um, come deadline. So I think Bellinger. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Bellinger. If Bellinger really comes back, then then, then they might want to extend the guy. I mean, obviously, um, but yeah, that's you know that's what my thoughts on it. Yeah, hot take. All right, you're going to be yeah. playing this a year from now. Diamondbacks okay. making the postseason. Diamondbacks. That's a good one. Making... I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. I think. Di- I think. I mean, I talked about that with Dan O'Dowd. Dan O'Dowd said on here, he's like, the Diamondbacks are really only a couple pieces away from being a team that can contend in the national league and i agree Mm -hmm. with it their outfield is very good they might move one of those guys um they have a lot of good young players the pitching staff is solid they probably could i think the thing they could use is like a like they could have used a rodan type of guy at the top of the rotation what do you like about him i well i mean they got the rookie of the year favorite right they do and corbin carroll i I would say yeah um, you know, their their rotation's strong at the top with Kelly and Gallen. Uh, they got a, yeah, you know, oh like, gosh. Kentel Marte can't be worse than he was last <laughs> year. And they were all right. You know, I do want to, when I just said that hot take, I was thinking about them playing in the NL West and they're, they're going to have an advantage over a team like the Phillies, who, I, I mean, I think they're going to have a little bit easier competition than the Phillies are. However, um, with realignment schedules are more balanced out now so you know we're only playing each team in the division 15 games instead of 19 games we're and playing i personally every... don't like that 
No, I don't either. I'd rather I'd rather have the Cubs and Cardinals play each other more times than the Cubs and the Blue Jays. I just don't think it serves a purpose. Like, I mean, I'd be fine with if you want to balance out the National League and they play more NL teams more, that'd be fine with me. But I the interleague the interleague play, I think at this point is really it was something that when we grew up twenty years ago, it was really fun and really exciting because you had mm-hmm. like three weeks where. I mean, I went to a Cubs and Red Sox game in t- 2005, and it's the first time they played each other in 90 years, and it's a game that I can remember. Those those showcase interleague games were really fun, and now it's like we have the Universal DH. We have, uh, you know, the interleague's not. I don't think it's very exciting anymore. It used to be fun. Now it's, yeah. it's over. We do it. We've overdone it. Well, here's a point. The Reds just won their first game at Fenway in 2022 since game seven of the 75 World Series. So 47 years. Like that's how they got, that's how little they played each other, you know? And And now they're going to play each other at, they're going to play at Fenway every other year now. Right. And of course, it's annoying for, I'm obviously not happy about it because I live in St. Louis and now the Reds are only going to come here. Um, two times every other year instead of three times every year. So that's annoying. Um, but if I, I would be okay with them realigning the, uh, uh, the, the leagues. I was trying, I was, I was trying to save myself from <laughs> saying conferences, I'm like not conferences. What is it? All right. The leagues. Yeah. Like, you know, play, play everyone. 10 times, you know, three series against everyone in your league and then keep six against or five even against the division. Like that'd be fun. Like All right. Said. Well, let's get back to the hot stove. Cause I, sure. I took us off the rails here. My apologies. Uh, last thing on the Mets. This is really the reason why this is such a big deal is Cohen is showing himself to be a guy that, He's he doesn't care about the luxury tax. He doesn't care about he's got enough money that he's just going to throw money and he's going to buy players and we're going to see how that works out for them. And by the way, like they're probably again on paper they already have a great team next year. They are a team that we both like I, like I said, I think they're going to win at least 95 games next year. Uh I'm they're playing in a hard division. I think the Braves might ed- I think I'd favor the Braves to slightly edge them out, but it's going to be very close. Um, so they're trying to win a championship in the short term, but long term, these big contracts do not serve teams well. And eventually, especially with Correa, you're looking at a guy who hasn't played a whole lot. You're paying him up until he turns 40. So there are going to be a lot of a lot of years on that contract that I don't think are going to age particularly well. Um, I also think that the way that teams are now, it's kind of like, Ryan, what, what's old is new right now with the uh, free agency because, you know, tw- again, 10, 20 years ago, we were seeing teams throwing out money like it was nothing. Like we saw that Marlins situation where they got Jose Reyes and they made a big play and the Angels have been doing the stuff where they get Pujols and Josh Hamilton. And I think a lot of teams in the mid 2000 mid 2010s abandoned that and were hesitant to spend and i think we saw that a little bit when harper and machado hit free agency and i don't know if it's a product of the phillies and the padres doing well in the postseason or or really what it is but what's old is new we are seeing these gigantic contracts for again I don't see. I don't think of any of these four shortstops as like top five to top ten players. Now that's arguable, um, but I mean, like I thought Machado. I think Machado is a top ten player. I think Harper is a top ten player. I don't think either any of these guys are up to that level, um, and we can talk about why. But for the for the most part, you're seeing an owner right now who just says, "Screw it, I'm just going to keep paying. I'm going to keep doing it." What this tells me with Correa. The Mets are not going to stop, even if they win a championship this year. It's not going to stop Cohen, and he they're going to be, they're going to make a very aggressive play for Shohei Otani a year from now. And that contract, you're looking at a team right now that has a that's going to have a payroll close to 500 million after luxury tax penalties, 
And Otani's contract could be a five hundred million dollar contract a year from now. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, and honestly, like I think we have to reevaluate how we measure these contracts, especially with the Mets with someone like Cohen who doesn't mind overpaying. If Correa performs like a ten million dollar contract per year, you could still call this a win because overpaying to him like does it. He doesn't really care. I mean, I think even he he said, like, sometimes you have to go a little bit over and, like, so what then? I think he would even tell you that Correa is not worth what – I mean, he's not going to say it publicly because he's not an idiot. But yeah, I, I guarantee you that he thinks that Correa is not worth what he paid him. But that doesn't really matter anymore for someone like him. On flip mm-hmm. side, it's probably a great year to be a team that's not in the free agent bidding. Right? Go on. Well, this year it's not going to matter, obviously, because you're not going to be able to compete because you're not going to be good enough. But teams like, okay, let's say the Dodgers, you know, they're going to have a lot of money to spend on Otani next year. Yeah. Maybe they can play. Machado is going to restructure his contract. He'll, likely he's going to stay with the Padres, but he's going to opt. He's already said he's going to opt out, which he should. You know, maybe they could snipe. Uh, Machado, I'm, I don't probably not because that actually that that didn't go so well for them in 2018. But, <laughs> um, you know maybe, uh, but they're gonna have yeah. a lot of money to spend uh, next year. It's like when I play Monopoly, I just want people to to spend as much money on the property when they have, you know, I want them to bid or in an auction draft. Same thing, fantasy. You just like I always nominate players that I don't want, and then just let mm-hmm. everyone bid and bid and bid and spend their money and then i swoop in for the players i do want when i have more money than them so yeah exactly right i think that's like you said dodgers there'd be some other teams like that that chose not to go that route and that's why i thought that's what the cubs personally should have done i think the cubs should have been patient and waited to identify what the needs would be with the club when they actually are closer to legitimately competing and turning a corner which they are not at that point yet now like you said maybe they're a wild card team but like if you want to talk about a team that well you will save the cubs for a little bit but yeah i think i think everything you said i will say i think the way that these guys are approaching these contracts now are a little different i think in the past there may have been a greater expectation that okay, I'm signing this guy for 10 years. He's going to be great for 10 years or at least eight years or whatever. Now it's, we are going for the big part of the 12 year contract is probably the first five. So he's going to be 20, he's 28 now. So you're 28 through 20, 33 seasons. That's probably what they're really paying for. And then you hope after those five years, that in the like year six through eight, you can get mid level type production, and then at the end, you're probably like you maybe not mid level, but above average. Yes, not the player that you had signed him to be, but still a good player. And then at the end, you'll just kind of take whatever you can get out of them because you expect that you know, age 37 or age 38, age 39, age 40, that is for lack of a better term, dead weight on the payroll. Yeah, teams have shown that they don't care about overpaying late. Very rarely are any of these contracts going to end well, those ninth, that tenth year. I mean, we saw it like with, I mean, obviously with Pujols, you know, I mean, obviously he just had a great final year, but that had nothing to do with that Angels contract. But he's a good one to look at for someone that's really going to fall off near the end. Um, eh, <laughs> What are going to say? Um, and in, in addition to that, like they get back and to that's me, what, that's <laughs> what makes the Hay Well, that's what makes the Jason Hayward contract so bad is you never got that at the top, at the beginning you you should theoretically at the very least get when you pay an elite sum, you should get an elite player for the first few years. And if you don't get that at all, then you know, it's a really bad contract. Right, and that, that's what I was – thanks for bringing out what I was trying to say. 
the problem that people fall into with free agent contracts is paying for what people were, not what they're going to be. Well, sometimes, though, they misproject. Like, that's what happened with Hayward. Hayward was, I think, 26 when he hit free agency, and he had come off his best year, and the idea was this is – He's going to go up like this and be a part of our long-term plans, and that's not what happened. I think that's similar thought process with Danzy Swanson. He's coming off his best year. Um, what will he be? His contract, I will say, is not does not have the same amount of years as these other guys. So with Swanson, he gets seven years, 177. You're looking at a guy who's going to be paid until he's 36, which is a significant difference between what the other three guys got, where Bogarts is 41 and Turner is 41, which is crazy to me. And I will say one more thing, though, about the even if the money does not matter that much, the roster spots matter because you're committing, like with the Phillies, what the Phillies are going to have is they're going to have, at some point, they're going to have Bryce Harper, Trey Turner, um, are any of those other contracts long term? Like Castellanos and Schwarber's were five years, I believe. Wheeler's five. Okay. So, but at some point, if you have a lot of these long term contracts, you're gonna have multiple roster spots that are gonna be like you. You're gonna have that option where you, I guess you could always, you know, DFA the guy and just let someone else have him for free which is probably going to happen with some of these contracts. And then you just, you're, you're paying 25 to $30 million per year on a player. That's really not playing and could potentially be taking up a roster spot. So I think that's the other, the other downside to these long-term deals. The DH and the NL changes the ball game too. Maybe we wouldn't be seeing deals like this for these short stops. If there were no DH in the NL, and, like, you, you know, I think we could all – we're probably on the same page that we think Xander Bogarts is going to be a DH, like, soon enough. But yeah. even if these shortstops don't move to DH, maybe they move to third base or maybe they move to second base and then some younger guy could come into shortstop. Whoever was at third base or second base is now the DH. Um, all and four I had of these heard, I By the way, I had heard from – there was something that I had heard – this was like not me reading stuff on the internet. This is me talking to people. I had heard that Turner was saying, no, I will not play another position behind besides shortstop. So maybe, maybe later, maybe that doesn't, maybe that doesn't mean that he's saying that he won't play it five years from now, but at the very least it, it's, it sounded like that could be a thing. So that's an, that's another thing to keep an eye on too. Yeah, we have to. We can step in the Jack Vita time machine ten years from now, but I think Turner's <laughs> deal is going to age the best. That's just my opinion. But uh, yeah, that's, um, I was going to ask you. So you like that contract? Do you think that's the best of the four contracts? I don't think any of them are good. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't. I mean, yeah, I think Correa's is easily the worst. But yeah, like I said earlier. I don't know if it really matters. Like, I wouldn't want my team to spend that money on Correa, but if I was a Mets fan, then it might make sense, actually. Yeah, well, the other thing that's interesting with Correa is part of the idea of, like, the value on him is that he's good defensively, but now you're putting him in a diminished role where really, like, third base, obviously, it's important defensively, but it's more of an offensive position than shortstop is shortstop. There's more of like, you want a guy who's great defensively and great offensively third base. You want a guy who just swings a big stick and Correa's bat. It's not like, I don't know. I, again, for what he's given offensively in his career, you're not talking about him the way you talk about Arenado. At least no one was until a couple of years ago. So I think that's another thing of like, Personally, if I was signing him to third base, that would decrease the value for me of what I'd be willing to pay him. Yeah, I mean, I think the situation's different because you have Lindor there. And, uh, you know, there'll probably be some plugging in where people are moving around a little bit. But, um, 
who did they have at third? Who were they going to run out at third base before Correa? I don't uh, even remember. Escobar. Escobar. Okay. Okay. So it's definitely a big step up. I mean, what's Correa, the third best third baseman now in the NL? Uh, so you got Machado, Arnado. Who else is in that category? Chris Bryant, when healthy. No, he doesn't play third anymore. No, he's going to be left field. Uh, which, honestly, Chris Bryant could be a similar comp to Correa, in all honesty, in terms of, like, I don't know. I thought I thought Correa, I thought Bryant was going to have a really good year last year. Like, I thought he was going to hit really well at Coors Field, and now it's like, can this guy stay healthy? And that's going to be a major concern, I think, for Correa, especially in this next chapter of his career. I'm trying mm-hmm. to think who else there is. Like, you have to think about teams. Like, uh, you've got... Oh, Austin Riley. I put I put I take Riley okay. over Correa. Would you take Riley over Correa for the season or for the next ten years? For the season, who's best right now? Duh. That's close. I'll take Correa. Okay, I would take Riley. I mean, Riley yeah. last year was like he was an MVP candidate. He had a great year. And I think he he seems to be just getting better. Again, you talk about durability. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't I don't even I'm not even sold that he's a top three Correa's a top three third baseman. Mm -hmm. Because again, this is something I'm gonna keep saying it. I know like it's I'm repetitive, a broken record, but like I get tired of people saying, well this guy's great when he's healthy or he's great, but he, if only he just didn't get hurt. Like part of being great is showing up to work every day. Like I would rather have someone who's good at their job that shows up 90% of the time. If I'm running a business than someone who's fantastic at it, but only shows up 60% of the time, 70% of the time or less than that. Like that's part of what makes you great is being able to stay on the field and be healthy and show up to work. I agree with you mostly, but I don't agree with you from the Mets because Why the regular that? season doesn't matter, <laughs> <laughs> which sucks. This is what we don't, this is what me and you, I'm speaking for you here, but this is what we don't like about the new version of baseball. Yeah. yeah. It's true. It's very true. Okay. So let's touch on some of these other, um, well, let's touch on some of these other, I, I, last, I guess the thing I'll put a bow on is, there's a lot of comparisons to Correa with a rod because this is very similar when he came over the Yankees moved over third base. A rod's a guy that again, like bonds, say what you want to about him, but a rod was a far superior player than Correa in terms of like a, an elite player MVP candidate year in and year out. And I just don't think that that's what the Mets are getting here and they're paying him like he is that. So but again, the other the counter to that is that these contracts are just going to keep going up, and so, you know, 20, 30 mil AAV in twenty twenty or twenty thirty two is going to mean nothing. Yes, sir. You had your I'm just raised. mad we missed out. On, yeah, I'm just, I'm just mad that we missed out on the Korea uh, on the Giants versus the Dodgers for the next thirteen I do years. Too. Yeah, that would have been, <laughs> been fun. so fun. It would have been so fun. And it would have been great. Giants fans and Dodger fans have never been more aligned than they are. They were yesterday. <laughs> they both don't like Korea now. <laughs> yeah, now there's like a peace treaty between yeah. the, the two fan bases rather than mm-hmm. like what really looked like could be a good part of a rivalry. Yeah. So the Padres made a big play for Judge. Mm-hmm. Judge goes back to the Yankees. Personally, I don't have a whole lot to add on the whole judge thing. I, I was not surprised. I I would have been more surprised if he did leave the Yankees. Were you thinking this is what would happen all along? No, I thought he was staying. Yeah. Um, When he was, like, getting booed during the postseason, I was getting a little bit like, okay, maybe. Like, this, this is stupid. Like, you guys don't deserve him. Like, come on. Like, he just had, like, the most dominant offensive season. Like, arguably in the history of baseball yeah. when you put everything together. Yeah. When you talk the about being clean or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, or or also just on top of that is the the context of what 
him batting 310 or whatever he batted this past year is kind of like, I mean, if, it's probably like batting 340 or 350 20 years ago. So, yeah. And I don't care what war says. And I love the stat of war. What was Judge's war? Like 10.5 or something? Something like that. And That's how many games did the Yankees win? Like 97? Uh, 90, yeah, 98 or 99. Without Judge, and if you just put in, let's just say, a, a replacement level player, I mean, do they win 85 games? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Barely. Barely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they needed him. Ha- they needed him. That has to be the biggest impact I've seen a single player on a team in a long time, right? It has to be. Absolutely. 100%. That's why he won the MVP. I mean, he yeah. was the most valuable player on a team that won its division. So the, the Padres miss out on Judge. They offered more money to Judge than the Yankees did. They also offered more money to Trey Turner. They offered $340 million, and Trey ends up taking three hundred to go play for the Phillies. Why do you think this is? The Padres weren't able to get these guys. And why did Bogarts have to get 280? Because, by the way, I talked to some people, too, before the Bogarts signing, maybe like a week ish days before it was actually days before and it sounded like bogarts was probably going to sit around 200 million 220 is kind of like the top of that but potentially even less than that he ends up getting 280 why do you think the padres have to pay what might be extra in order to get these guys i i mean when i saw that they offered judge 400 million you know which which then everything that i've seen like you know how Sometimes articles are misleading. N- not a Jack Vita article, but other <laughs> articles are misleading. You know, I saw that first. I'm like, 400 million? What the heck? Well, it was 400 million 11 years. It, so it really was the same like AV, AAV. Yeah. But, but still more still, money. Still, it's more yeah. guaranteed. You're going to make more money. Your career's going to be longer. When I saw that, I thought one of the criminals from Drake and Josh Go Hollywood got out of jail. <laughs> And is working for the Padres, printing money from a stolen stolen money press from the White House. All right, I don't know how many of you got that reference, but I know you did, Jack Vita. <laughs> yes, I did. I don't know, like, and then also like, don't go to the auction against. Don't go to auction against the San Diego Padres because you'll have someone be like two hundred, like two hundred one. The next person's like two hundred three, and then Padres are like three hundred and fifty. <laughs> like what? I don't. I didn't like like you said. I didn't see anything near that for Bogarts. I mean, are they thinking they're going to move Tatis and they're like, "I don't care." I mean, I I don't know. I I've told I don't know if I've ever said this on your show, but like I I know I've texted you saying pop my prediction for the Padres is they don't win a World Series the next 2 or 3 years and then they are in big trouble for the next yeah. 5 to 7 years. I think they're yeah. I don't think they're going to win one and they're going to be in a lot of trouble because they're going to have a lot of bad contracts and they just, they haven't shown any, I don't even think there's any reason to say that they're going to stop doing what they've been doing as far as just shelling out money to whoever. Yeah. I think they're going to be another one of those teams where they're going to have a lot of bad contracts on their hands. As you mentioned, Um, we just talked about the potential danger of something like that. However, I th- my thought, and I believe what happens here with the Padres is they are a victim of the California state income tax because, and this is a legit thing, like I've talked, this is something I have heard that, I mean, if you look at it and you calculate the $340 million that Trey Turner was offered by the Padres and you just say, What's twelve and a half percent of that? And you, you or the cal- There's a tax calculator you can look it up. He would he gets more money playing in in Philadelphia, where Pennsylvania has a six and a half percent state income tax. Um, that makes a big difference when you're talking about three hundred million dollars. So Turner gets more money playing in and and being in Pennsylvania than he would. In California, he got a taste. By the way, he's also from the East Coast. His wife's from Jersey, so that that's another part of it. He got a taste of what it's like to have 
Uh, the politicians eat up a bunch of that contract the last couple of years in LA probably didn't like it. Um, so, I mean that, I think that's a legit thing. I mean, Bogart's 280. I don't know what that is compare comparable to, to the second place team of what Bogart's was probably offered. But it, I think you have to, if you, at this point in time, and I don't know that maybe the Dodgers, the Dodgers have been maybe a little more savvy where they're not just throwing money out willy nilly. But if the Dodgers wanted to, they, they probably have to do the same thing. I think with that, and I, I guess I don't, I'm not an, a, an auditor. I'm not a tax expert. I'm not an accountant. I don't know a whole lot about this stuff. So I don't know if this is this income tax thing is such a big thing now compared to 10 years ago. Like the, in terms of the difference between what California is and Pennsylvania or even New York, I mean, judge, judge, I, it was, it, they have a lower income tax in New York than they do in California. And also Zach Eflin was essentially offered the same exact contract by the Red Sox that he ended up taking with the Rays and Florida has no state income tax. And so, I mean, it's a, it's unfortunate that neither of these Florida teams have a ton of money because they could really capitalize on not having a state income tax. I think that the great equalizer has always been living in sunny South California. Yeah. Um, maybe that's changing a little bit. Obviously, that depends on who you are. Not everyone wants to go live in. Like, for me, it wouldn't matter that much. But I think for a lot of people living, like, in San Diego does matter. Um, I would but maybe it. it's changing a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, would you? Yeah. I hope that I'd happens. I'd be so happy. I'd go to the beach every day. I'd pick up surfing. It'd be it'd be a life. I'd be living. I'd yeah. move in with Drake and Josh. Yeah, there you go. So, there you go. You can go to a podcast. I move in with one of them. Finger. <laughs> which one? Which one? Uh, you, um, uh, by the way, that Zach Eflin deal, and I'm really putting myself out there now because the Rays have never made a bad move in the history of the universe. I hate that deal, but since it's the Rays, I'm sure it was perfect. <laughs> um, as a Reds fan, like, never trade with the Rays. <laughs> That's <laughs> never true. trade with the Reds. That's true. That's a good um, point. Why do you hate it? He's not that good. Like, why? Why are they paying? What is it? Uh, three years, forty-five. Three years, forty. Something? Three years, forty. So, I mean, it's not a ton of money, but it's it is the biggest. For the Braves, in the it is. It is, and in, in the biggest in their contract in their franchise history, and it's similar to. The tie-on deal with the Cubs. The Cubs gave four years, sixty-eight million dollars for tie-on. These neither of these contracts are going to like ruin your franchise if you miss on them. But it's just kind of like the, the I, you kind of wonder why. And then the other thing of like they, I think what it comes down to though is for whatever reason, someone in that analytics department, someone in that front office thinks. This guy has this potential that's up here, and we think we can find, help him meet that potential. And that's that was the Zach Wheeler deal. Zach Wheeler, although was a much better pitcher than both of them up to that point in his career, the idea was we think that he has another level or more that he can get to, and we are projecting him up here. And the Cubs had Tyon as their number two pitcher on their free agent board behind Verlander. And to me, I'm just like, I think he's an average pitcher. I don't think you and I have talked about this off the air. I don't know why teams, especially teams like the Cubs that realistically are not going to be competing for a world series. What's the rush to try to sign a back end of the rotation pitcher, unless they truly do believe that this guy is going to become an ace where I'm skeptical. Cause he's had two Tommy John's. And I just don't see that kind of stuff out of him. I think he's a good guy that fills out your rotation at the back end. But, I mean, the Yankees didn't want to give the ball to him and instead went with Nestor Cortez on three days rest in the postseason. He also lost that other game against Cleveland. I think it was game two. So that's just one where I'm like, I think there's a bigger gap between a true ace and like a number three than there is between a number three and a fringe starter that you might be able to pick, call up from AAA 
given how dominant pitching is right now. And maybe that changes with the shift being banned and some of the some of the stuff we're gonna do that makes it a little more offensive friendly, but I, I don't know. That was that was probably the move that the Eflin one was surprising. The Tyon one was another one that I was just I, I don't really know, especially given how many young pitchers the Cubs have and how many of them, even a guy like Adrian Sampson, who they basically plugged in on a minor league contract and was very effective. He had three one eight ERA last year. I, I just I don't get it. Yeah, the game has changed. And up until last year, we've talked about this off the air. I'm you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm sure you I think you agree with me. Before this year, I would have rather had a rotation like the Cardinals had, where you have five guys that are all at least number threes, probably. Like, the Cardinals number five last year, in Jordan Montgomery, maybe you'd call him a number five. He's a solid number three. Um, you know, Adam Wainwright, right now, solid number three. Miles Michaelis, probably a number two. Quintana last year performed like a number two he's probably a number three um clarity was probably the five last year right i i mean generally he'd be more like a two but you have guys up and down that their number five starters like a number three that's what i would have had wanted in the past now i'd rather have a team of a top you know a a cy young contender at one an all-star at two and then whatever you know, a, a bunch of four and fives for the rest of rotation. As long as you make the postseason, look at the Phillies. That's what they had. They had yeah. Cy, they had like, you know, Cy Young contender and Wheeler and All Star and Nola. And then the Phillies had number three? basically the Phillies had they had a top two, they had a good number three and Suarez, right. and then they had no five. It was essentially right. the thing. They they didn't even have that at the end. So now you look at what they're doing with they they added who did they add? They got a couple guys. They signed there was a pitcher that they signed. Well they lost they lost Cindergard. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, they're fine yeah. With, they're fine with that. They signed somebody. It was um it wasn't Quintana. It was similar to oh, Taiwan Walker. So right. like Taiwan yeah. Taiwan Walker is kind of like what they're they're thinking with that. I I don't know. If, if I was a Phillies fan, I would have rather had my team go all out to sign Carlos Rodon or DeGrom or Verlander, one of those guys, instead of Turner. And then I would have just tried to, you know, trade for Willie Adamas or Jorge Mateo. Because I think really, I don't think the Phillies need Turner's bat all that much. What they do need is an imp- they need to improve their team defensively. I don't think Turner makes them much better defensively. I don't think they care a whole lot about defense. Um, and I think if they – can you imagine if that team, like in that series last year against the Astros, if they had – after those two guys, if they had Verlander. And I know Verlander had his hiccups in the postseason last year and that some of that's fair, but if, could you imagine if they had a third one of those two guys? That changes that series significantly, doesn't it? No, because now I'm going to be cynical. But no, <laughs> because they pulled the Kevin Cash pulling a Blake Snell. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In Game Six, so it wouldn't have mattered because. Yeah. But I mean, I the outlook of the series, where you're looking at the Astros had a much deeper pitching staff. They had a better bullpen. They had a deeper rotation, and they up to that point. It worked. What they did was so well was they played a best of three series. They played a best of five series. And if those are your first two rounds of the postseason, then you're set up extremely well. If you just have two great pitchers, right. you re- like you're saying, you only need two for those first two rounds. And what happened with San Diego was San Diego eliminated the other yeah. big dog. Right. So, and then the Phillies took out the big dog and the Braves. So what it should have been by chalk was it should have been the Dodgers, Mets, one of those two teams, and then the Braves, probably. But instead, right. those two teams took out the big dogs on the short series, and then they just had to play the Padres, which is different in a seven-game series than playing the Dodgers. Right. A team very similar to them. So I think that that method gets you through 
it, it's it can it can if you you like if you only have those two guys, you can no doubt get to the World Series with those two guys. But in order to win the World Series, you need a little more than just that, and we saw that. Yeah. Yep. So that was what we were talking. We were talking about the Cubs on that topic. Uh, we've touched on the Phillies. I mean, the Turner contract. You think that's going to age the best? Why is that? Because his, I, I know his game is like somewhat centered around speed, but he has a very good like contact bat. He has some sneaky power. He's an athletic guy. I don't see him being unathletic in his late thirties. Yeah, he's not going to be like stealing you know, 40 bags a season or anything, but I think he's still going to be an above average athlete. All right. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. And I think, again, that's another thing where it's like, if you're talking about the asset, yeah, probably so. Um, the reason I wouldn't like, I just don't think any of these four, if I'm a team that needs a shortstop, I don't look at any of them being that piece for 10, like obviously throw out the whole thing about the 10 years like, there's a, a flaw with each of them. With Turner and Bogarts, it's the defense. That's a concern. It's not like you're paying for a premium defensive shortstop. And, you know, Turner's not bad. I, I shouldn't make him sound like he's a, you know, he's not a bum. But, it, again, if you're paying top dollar, like, so you get that with Swanson. Swanson's great, but then there are concerns about his bat. And then Correa, it's like, it should be the full package, but how much is he going to play? So, I don't know. I I actually think the Swanson investment is the best because it has the least amount of risk because I really don't think based on like you're looking at a guy it's get it's funny 7 years we're talking about 7 years not being a long-term investment but it's just comparable comparing it to the other 3 this guy is only going you're paying him up till he's 36 you're not paying for him until he's 41 that's a five-year difference and then at the very least even if he flops offensively you should for the next few years get a gold glove caliber shortstop which is going to become more valuable in this new era with without the shift you're going to need these elite defensive players the thing for me is I don't know I don't think the Cubs needed to do it I don't think the Cubs I, again, I would wait to spend that money. And I think that watching the Cubs, I saw three guys on the major league team that I saw as potential building blocks for when this team legitimately is good again. And they've transformed their farm system over two years. Two years ago when Theo exited, they were the 22nd best farm system in baseball. Now they're a top 10 one. So like they're doing some stuff that's setting them up well for the future. But I looked at the three guys. I thought Suzuki, Horner, and Magical. And I know there's uh, with Magical it's similar. It's like, can this guy stay on the field? How good might this guy end up being defensively? He doesn't have power. There are concerns with Magical. But for me, I saw enough when he was healthy last year to say, we've got this guy under club control for the next four years. Let's just run it back with this middle infield with him and Horner. And I thought that that was one of the strengths of the team already going into next year. Horner really broke out last year. I think he's a really good player. Um, and I just, I didn't see this, the Swanson thing other than um, there, there must be something that they're not as keen on with magical. I don't know. Maybe there's his medicals don't look great. Um, for whatever reason, they don't seem to love him and value him. And then the other thing would be is uh, they really well, there was an un, a crazy amount of pressure to make some kind of splash and spend some money this off season. And if you're making that decision based on, um, I think Bill Belichick or Vince Lombardi once said, if you listen to the fans, you'll be joining them up there someday. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Um, I I don't know. I. It, I, I like what you're saying about how we don't even really know what we have yet. We don't have a big enough body of work from these other uh, young guys to know what holes we really do have. And maybe shortstop is something that we're already fine at where we don't need to be shelling out almost $200 million in a contract. Yeah, I just don't. 
I mean, is Swanson even going to be an All Star? I don't. They he's got one season. To, yeah, they're looking at last year. He was a six war player. Their thought is he remains at this. Now, yeah. the things again. Here's the thing: if this club was, if you're like this, would be. I think this would be a really good move for Philly. Like Philly could use a defensive shortstop, and I guess they, they don't really need a leader. They've got a lot of guys on that team. But if you're a team that is a shortstop away, you need a guy who can contribute right away. This is a really, really good player who potentially could continue to improve. But again, you're looking at with the Cubs, the first two years of this contract, I don't think are going to matter all that much. So that's like when you talk about these long-term deals, you want that guy to be elite or whatever, whatever it is that you're paying him for, you're expecting that right away. And you, if you get that out of Swanson in the next two years, if he's a, an all-star the next two years, it's probably not going to matter. My response is, if Swanson's like your fourth best player, that's fine. Yeah. But I feel like the Cubs are almost paying him to be the guy, and I don't think he's the guy. He's had one season. For him, it's really a what you know, really a projection into the future deal because he's it only is. had one season above a three a three war. And like you know, you're looking at a player who does strike out a lot. One other thing that I think is interesting is StatCast has his arm strength last year as the weakest among all shortstops. Now, I don't know what that means. I really don't know if this is a legit like metric. How are you arriving at this decision? And, you know, does it really matter? How big of a gap is, you know, is it a significant gap if he's a 78 and the league average is 84 or whatever it is? Like, is that something that's significant? I legitimately don't know anything about this metric yet. And then the other thing would be is, you know, how much is that being determined on if he gets to a ball early and he, he doesn't have to throw it as hard if he gets to the ball sooner than another player. So there are like things to look out for with this contract. It's not the type of contract though. If he, if he totally flops, it's not going to be a contract that's going to kill your team. If you're the Cubs. Yeah, I'm. I mean, this stat cast stuff is good. Is like people are talking about it, like the new great metric, right? Yeah. But we don't know. Um. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know what the difference. I mean, I don't. I don't really have much to add to that. I don't. I'm on the same boat no. as you on that. Yeah. One. I don't. So okay, so we talked about really all these short stops. Bogarts is age 30. He got 11 years. That's a that's a big contract. We talked about the Padres. We talked about the Mets. I'm looking through some of these uh, free agent deals. Um, you know, going back to what we were talking about with pitching, I really like what the I really like what the Yankees did with Carlos Rodon. And I know there are people concerned about his own health, but I think what this move does is if Rodon can be the pitcher he was the last two years, which it look, to me it looks like this guy's turned a significant corner. He was a top 10, top 5-ish pitcher the last two years in the American League and in the National League. If you add that to your team and you have him behind Garrett Cole and now you're looking at Nestor Cortez as a 3 and Frankie Matas was someone that they acquired at the deadline, kind of hoping to be the Rodon spot of like the number two guy behind him because they they traded for him instead of Luis Castillo I think they regretted that I mean but now Matas coming off an injury Matas there's a lot less asked of him now which is good for him there's going to be less pressure on him and he's looking at you're looking at him as your potential fifth starter because you have Severino and Herman. I think that the Yankees made a Big power move by getting Rodon here, and I think now you're looking at them in that same conversation among best rotations in the American League. Yeah, and the AL is pretty wide open now. Um, the Astros regressed, and uh, you know they were. How do, how do we know that? Well, they lost Verlander. They did, but now they got Hunter Brown, and they won more games without Correa. That with uh, with Pena at short, so I'm not convinced that they're going to regress. I think they will a little bit. I mean, we'll they're see. still very good, but 
I don't think they're like unbeatable by any by any stretch of the imagination. Well, part and of the, the part of the fact that they were unbeatable last year was because the American League was not that deep. It was like, right, and it's still not. It's not. No, absolutely. I mean, I thought I remember going in like after Tampa went to the World Series in 2020. I remember having a conversation. Who's more likely after 2020 World Series to come back the next year, go back to the World Series? Is it Tampa? Is it the Dodgers? I said Tampa for that same reason. I thought Tampa, and they had two years ago. I mean, now we're talking about 2021. They had a great regular season that year, too. So they, mm-hmm. they very well could have. Yeah, Boston snuck up Yeah, behind them. So, yeah, American League's wide open. I mean, you've got just off the top of my head, if I'm talk, if I'm thinking teams that – you got obviously the Yankees and the Astros, but then I put the Mariners in there. I think Blue Jays. Blue Jays. You know what? Blue Jays kind of have the feel of like a team that's really good that's never going to be great. Okay. Um, but they're going to be they're going to be in the mix for sure. Cleveland. Cleveland. Tampa. Like Tampa's rotation is going to be great next year. I think they could have a they could have a really strong next year. And then there's probably one other team that I'm forgetting. Is there anyone else in that AL East? No, oh, Baltimore. Baltimore yeah. could be. Baltimore has the potential to enter into that competitive window, and then after that, you've got like some other teams that are going to be solid. Like the White Sox are, you know, competitive. Mm. No, you're you're saying no. <laughs> and they'll be like five hundred in that. Yeah, division. yeah, that's the that's like the next group. So really, in terms of teams that can actually win the American League next year, Houston, Seattle, Cleveland, New York, Tampa. Those are those would be the ones I would say. Toronto, I throw, Toronto, throw Toronto in there. You throw but... Toronto in there. Yeah. Would you throw Baltimore in there too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I but I think there's like I don't know. I see. I kind of see a cutoff between. But anyway, those are your teams. That's sure. So. I just don't. I don't think anyone's going to steamroll through the league next year. Yeah. So you think you think this league is going to be better next year? You think American League is going to be more better? competitive? Yes. Yeah. Talent wise, no. I think it's down. <laughs> it's going to be more competitive, American League. I like what the Yankees did there. I thought that was a really good move. They're still going to need to figure out their lineup, though, because yeah. the Yankees, that's the problem, is hitting in the postseason. They're, they've they structured their lineup extremely well to hit a lot of home runs to right field, but when you get into the postseason, you need to be able to do a little more than that. And going to that series against Houston, I did not know a single Yankees fan that believed that their team would win that series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're. I don't like that lineup at all. It's good for the regular season, like. But then the other thing, yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll keep moving on because we got to touch on some other ones. So we talked Mets, uh, Dodgers bring back Kershaw. What do you think the Dodgers are doing? Saving it, for Otani. Saving for Otani. You think Gavin Lux is going to play shortstop for them next year? Probably. I think I do think that there could be a trade or two that happens before the end of the year. I think. I think Adamus is a good trade chip. You had said to me that you thought Milwaukee could go into a full-scale rebuild mode. That wouldn't surprise me. Maybe they make those deals though at the deadline. So that could maybe maybe we hold off on that for now. I think um, they're going to wait one more year. See how this the, year goes. The Orioles are getting calls on uh, Mateo right now. So that would be. That doesn't seem like a Dodgers move. That seems like maybe. I'm just trying to think where he would fit in. Like, if you lost one of your shortstops, so maybe like Atlanta. I feel like Seattle, maybe. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, but isn't he and Crawford kind of the same thing? I mean, he's better than Crawford, I think. Yeah, but how significantly? Like, is it? I, I guess not. I don't know. Okay, so let's see what else we got. Houston, they picked up Jose Abreu. I thought that was a great signing. Yeah, I agree. I think that the Sox made a huge mistake not making him a White Sox for life. I mean, that contract's only three years. It's like a three-year 60-ish, I think. Yeah. He's at age 35. 
The White Sox, I know the White Sox don't really spend a lot, but still, I mean, come on. That's essentially what you're giving Liam Hendricks right now. Yeah, I would have tried to keep him. I would have upped that. And you're going to lose a lot in leadership. I did like the Benintendi move for the White Sox. I think that's uh, that's a kind of player they need, that he should make their club better defensively. He should get on base for them. The other move I would have liked to see them make would have been Joey Gallo um, because I think that that lineup did not hit a lot of home runs last year in a ballpark that's very conducive to hitting home runs. And I would add a power bat, and Gallo is a pretty good defensive player too. So um, I would have made I would have made two of those signings. We'll see what they do with the other corner outfield spot and second base. Personally, I think they might trade for Nick Madrigal and bring it back. Could be. I mean, that would make sense. I'd, I'd be. Well, when the Cubs want in return, I don't see. This is why I think the Swanson signing. Like the problem is, they're they kind of have to trade Magical now because where are you going to play him? He's not third. Ba- He's like five foot eight. You don't put a guy that short at third base as a full time. Like you want to like? Does it really? Your... Does his height really matter for third? <laughs> Bregman yeah, third small. base. Third base. They like guys who are like you know six three. They like guys in the hot corner. But Bregman's like 5'8", right? No, not he's, eight. Not, he's like 5'11". Like he's, like he's like 6'1". No, he's under No, sorry, five. sorry. He's six foot nothing. He's probably really 5'10". Yeah. He's listed at six foot. Um, you can't sorry, move yeah. Horner. But, I mean, Magical's, list, Magical's listed as 5'8". Five, five he's more like 5'6". Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I think you could do it. I just don't think that... I, it seems kind of like now it's kind of like what's your plan with Magical because it he's he just doesn't seem like a long term piece and you have him under contract for four years like that's an asset that could be attractive but now everyone knows that you want to trade him and now you're, yeah like that's the problem so like if you're gonna trade him trade him like a month ago before you make the before signing. you bring it yeah so now it's like the Sox could I think the Sox can get him for cheaper than they flipped him for. Um, and they get him back four years under club control. I thought he, I thought he was a nice piece in that lineup um, as like another contact bat. So I think that'd be a good move. I like the Tyler Anderson signing for the Angels. I thought that was another one that it was kind of low risk, three year, thirty nine million. You weren't as big on that one, were you? Not really. I think he. I don't think he's going to replicate you what think he did. He peaked. Okay. Yeah. I I liked that one. Uh, I'm going through these. Uh, Gene Segura, he remains unsigned. We've got uh, Christian Vasquez, Kiermaier to the Blue Jays, uh, Profar unsigned. I like Drury to the Angels. Oh yeah. Why is that? Uh, I think he's really happy to be there. That's his team that he rooted for growing up. And he's two years, about $8 million a year, about two years, seven, seventeen million. Um, I think he, you know, you, he's an ultra utility guy. He can plug in anywhere. He had a really good, you know, comeback year last year. I think he fits in well there. You know, like in the six hole. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with you. I think another one, I'd say probably – Honestly, in terms of value signings, I think Josh Bell on a two-year deal to Cleveland. Yeah. They, they needed another power bat in that lineup. I think that adds another dimension to that team. Um, and this is a player who, he was a big-time prospect. And, I mean, he had a really good first half last year, too. He, he didn't do that well, as well, at Petco Park, which probably hurt him financially quite a bit, that he only took two years, $33 million. But age 30... Again, I like short-term contracts. I like contracts where you're not, you know, doing this ten-year stuff. Cleveland is among the best in terms of value. They needed. They kind of identified what they needed. They went out and got it. Would you it, pencil or pen Cleveland in to win the NL oh, or the yeah. AL Central? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think last year I, I've debated Cleveland with some friends. Um, one of them I was talking to last week when I was in Phoenix, JJ Jaggard, who's been on here a number of times he's a huge Yankees fan and he did he he didn't think Cleveland was that good compared to the Yankees and I said you know like he's he said like Yankees should have really run through that team and I said man that series in Cleveland if it's and it's a best of five or even if it's just a best of seven I think Cleveland wins that series their pitching was better they were just 
punching in bunches, kept hitting, hitting, hitting. Um, every single inning, it felt like they were threatening. And then, meanwhile, you got Bob Costas over here talking about like, oh my gosh, this is like shocking. This is this is like a team that dominated the regular season. The Yankees won somewhere between like five and six more games, five or six more games than the in the, the Guardians did. The Guardians were a much better team in the second half. Second half, season. yep. They brought up a lot of guys. Um, they got all the that the core of that team. They have for a number of years. The division's not good. Strong um, back half of the bullpen. Great end of the bow. Uh, great back end of the bow, bullpen. Rotation is very good. Maybe they want to add another starting pitcher, depending on how things play out. Maybe they they get another guy at the deadline. But I think they're set up exceptionally well, and I think they got better. I think they got two power bats in that lineup now. And maybe they they might add another catcher because right now I think their two catchers are Bo Naylor or not not Bo um yeah Bo Naylor the brother Josh mm-hmm. Naylor's brother they got him and they have uh, Mike Zunino and I feel like they might want to add like Tucker Barnhart just got picked up by the Cubs he seems like a guy that would have fit Cleveland well as kind of another catcher but Zunino and Bell. Those are two power bats, and this team was very contact heavy. I think they were 29th or 28th in home runs a season ago, and I don't think you necessarily need to lead lead the league in home runs. In fact, I like teams that put the ball in play and hit for contact and aren't so dependent on home run strikeout or three true outcomes. But they add just you know two power bats in that lineup. Bell is a potential. I mean, he's an all star a year ago. And has been an all star in the past. So I think this is a great signing. I think that might be, in terms of value, two years, $33 million, Josh Bell. I love it. Yeah. The, uh, the, um, Indian, the Guardians continuing to be good will be great for baseball. Yeah. I love their brand of baseball. They're a very good team. They're not, they're not a Cinderella at all. I mean, I guess from a financial standpoint, they are, but not from a talent. Here's the thing, like my friend said, he's like, Jack, you just like teams that are like these small market teams. And I'm like, it's not because they, I see them as like these lovable underdogs. It's because I think they do things better than big market teams a lot of the time Mm -hmm. because they're looking at cost per win and they're not blowing some of these, blowing their money on some of these contracts that I personally wouldn't sign. I think that J Ram contract is awesome. It's great. It's great, and I think and there are a lot of things that they have to do because if they go out, like Baltimore went out, and they they don't have a whole lot of money, but they went out and they gave Chris Davis that contract, and it crushed them. It was horrible. They couldn't keep Machado. like, And so if you make one bad move like that, you go all in on a player and it doesn't pan out, you're screwed. So I think naturally, not all these teams, because there are a lot of teams that are small market that don't do things very well, but I just – I'm continuously uh, impressed by how Tampa and Cleveland, how, how they go about things and how they, like you talk about Tampa, they win basically every trade that they make. There are only a couple that they don't win. And Cleveland right now, even it, it's not even about the, it's not about the, the finances or anything like that. It's what you're talking about in terms of this is a team that puts the ball in play and hits for contact steals bases and plays great defense that is the best version of baseball to watch on tv i remember watching ryan you remember in the middle of the season i think i i feel like i was kind of in on cleveland a little earlier than other people you were yeah so i was kind of like i think cleveland's gonna do this i think they're great and i remember like a few days later they came into town played the white Sox. i went to one of those games and i was watching um, on TV and Ozzy Guillen is like, oh my gosh, this team is just like beautiful to watch on, on TV. Like they're so fun to watch because this is like, this is good entertainment form of baseball. You want to see triples. You want to see doubles. You want to see plays at the plate. You want to mm-hmm. see great defense diving catches. You don't want it. Like the shift is a boring version of you're not getting those diving catches. You're not getting that stuff. And then, the other thing is just the the when you're getting three true outcomes, home run, strikeout, walk, that's not a very fun product either because you're wanting to see balls in play. You're wanting to see balls in the gap. You're wanting to see action. You don't get a lot of action when 
teams are swinging for the fences. So I wrote my piece. You guys can check it out on fastball. It's I said that Cleveland. It's, it's like twenty years after Moneyball. Moneyball. Everyone sort of followed that blueprint of Oakland was zigging when everyone else was zagging with uh, on base percentage and this at the time batting average and RBI were being overrated and now it's like we've swung so far the opposite direction that batting average and RBI I think both are are underrated so I think Cleveland saw um, a marketplace uh, an opportunity to, to take advantage of that because other teams were not valuing these contact hitters and I think they're gonna they're gonna run away with the central. They're gonna win that division by nine, ten games, maybe more. And I think they're a legitimate team that can c- compete in the American League. Completely agree. And and we've talked about, you know, those top ten guys. You've really talked about that. Ramirez is a top ten guy. Yes. He's a great player. He's like you know what's funny about him is he he's got good speed for a guy who doesn't look like he'd have good yeah. speed. Yeah, <laughs> and good power for a little dude. Yeah. I always enjoy those kind of athletes when you're like, wow, that guy's really fast. I, yeah. I didn't peg him to be really fast. Um, What's the worst contract? So I, I would say, I don't know, I guess I should ask you, best contract so far. I like that Josh Bell one. Are, are there any other nominees in this category? Hmm. Let's see. I'll run through some names here. Yeah. Michael Brantley, Jose Abreu. Um, oh, we didn't even mention Contreras. I don't know what the Cardinals are doing with Contreras. They are they got worse defensively. Yeah. Replacing Molina with Contreras. That was weird. I was surprised by that. going to be a DH in two years. I mean, Probably. If, like, if Yvonne Herrera turns out, it'll be fine. But... Um... I like the Gallo flyer. Yeah, I like that one too. Ben Intendi, you like Ben Intendi? Nah. No. Nah. Gallo's a one year. Do you like Bellinger? It's fine for one year. It's obviously too much, but it's one year. Yeah, it's one if year. If he's half of what he used to be, a lot of guys with these shoulder issues, it does take a while to come back. So, but he's always had a massive hole in his swing. So. I thought if I was Bellinger, I would have tried to go to there. Are, there are a couple places like I was thinking Atlanta because they're so good at getting those guys on the one year deals and maxing out on their abilities. That's how I they think. won with their outfield in 2021. Yeah. And like before that, they got a lot of Donaldson and then Donaldson got paid. So I would have just gone over to uh, I think his name's Brian Steltzer, the hitting coach. I would have gone over there. I would have gone to Atlanta. There were a couple other places. I think he actually would have been a good fit for the White Sox too because that's I think he'd hit well in that park. Um, and again, he'd be something that they need. The or Cubs Toronto. have been, yeah, Toronto. The Cubs have been like cycling through hitting coaches every year. So I don't. <laughs> that was what was like kind of odd with that fit. Mm-hmm. Um, Jacob Degrom. Is that the worst contract? No. We I didn't think touch it's, on it. Yeah, I think it's actually pretty good. It's only five years. It's the not... fit's just weird. <laughs> yeah, Texas is doing the same thing that they did 20 years ago. They signed A-Rod, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's five years, what, 144 or something? 137, I want to say. Okay. What I is mean, the worst? Uh, Correa? No, because it's the Mets. Yeah, so like to them, that contract isn't going to right. hurt them the way that another contract would On hurt most teams team. it would be, but not with the Mets. Um, Bogarts? Maybe. I really don't like the Swanson deal, but the risk isn't horrible. Yeah. I just don't see. Well, and also to your point, to your point though, like the Cubs don't have anything like that on their payroll in the future. So like, unlike the Mets, yes, they have lots and lots and lots of money. 
And by the way, this idea that people are like, oh, yeah, the Cubs don't spend money is an absolute lie. They had a top three payroll in the National League for three or four straight years. Um, They had the top payroll in the National League one year. And during those three years, 2018, 2019, 2020, they won zero playoff games. So they had to they had to do something to shake things up. They had to kind of start over. I don't think any of those contracts that like the Bryant contract does not look good. The Bias contract looks really bad. Rizzo is taking these, you know, the Cubs offered Rizzo more money than he ended up signing on the open market. Mm-hmm. He, they offered him five years for seventy million, I think it was. And he ends up taking a two year deal and then or a one year deal and then I think he, he or he had an opt out. And now I think he's got another two year deal. I, I can't remember, but maybe it's another one year deal. But you know, and part of his success is conducive to him playing at Yankee Stadium where he's a pole hitter in short shallow right field. So I don't think any of those decisions have looked poorly yet. Um, they have a lot of money. They've shown that they will spend money when they're ready to compete. I just don't see why they felt the need to spend money now. I think the worst contracts are like the Italian contract, the T- Tajan Walker contract, the Tyon Walker, the Zach Eflin contract, like these very like mid like over just with our new narrative of how baseball is going. Yeah. The, multi-year like the three plus year 15 million dollar more average for a three or four in your rotation pitcher i think those are really bad deals now so those that's my answer i agree that's a great point i think i agree well thank you jack yeah no i mean that's like again we talk about it like what what the cubs the cubs did a really good job of filling out their rotation really over the last year also last two years last year with Adrian Sampson on a minor league deal gives you a three ERA. I don't think it's that hard to find guys like that to fill out your rotation, whereas it is harder to find those legitimate elite arms. And like Tyon is going to his him pitching is going to come at the expense of the Cubs not being able to give one of their rotation one of their rotation spots to one of their young pitchers that could have a potential higher ceiling than Tyon, who is club controllable for the next X amount of years. Yep. I don't like the overpays on one year deals are fine. Like they're, yeah. I almost, I totally get it. Year. Yeah. And then the mega deals, you know, the mega deals are what they are. You're going to get something out of that. And everyone gets that they're overpays and everyone understands why they have to be overpays. It's these mid deals that I really don't, I really don't like them, especially on the pitching side. I agree with you. Okay. Uh, is there anything else? I mean, we got a few guys who are unsigned. Is there any, you think there's any uh, diamonds in the rough out there? Trey Mancini, maybe. I lo- I want, I wanted the Reds to get Trey Mancini. And I said, we would end up getting Will Myers, which is what happened, <laughs> yeah. which is fine. Re- like Will Myers Reds is- have done some stuff today. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need, that's fine. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I'm very satisfied with what we've done today, but I mean, Will Myers is fine. I just think Mancini's a little better. Luke Voigt, maybe. Luke Voigt. Yeah, he's still out there, isn't he? Yeah. Um, there was another outfielder I thought that was kind of interesting. Let me see. I should take a look. I wrote something about the Rays. The Rays and the Blue Jays were in on Michael Brantley. Um. I can't remember. I wrote this the other day of like who the Rays could sign instead. Cause you know, if you're, if you're in the mix for one of those guys, I'm thinking you want to add another, another bat or a potential other outfielder. And one of the things I thought of was, Oh yeah. Okay. So if the Rays want to add another bat, obviously Conforto and Mancini are out there, but I said they have the chance to bring back a former Ray. One was Will Myers. The other one, Evan Longoria. That's a good one. You, That's you a think really that, good one. You think that would be a good, uh, like, one-year deal? Yeah, the even two. Back? Even two-year yeah. deal. Yeah, and I'd like, like that. It'd be kind of like the Granky back to Kansas City, which it sounds like he's going to go back to Kansas City. Kansas City's rotation, though, is not good. <laughs> All in on Brady Singer, I guess. He's good, man. He is good. Yeah. Wow. Behind him. 
I mean, they brought in Jordan Lyles the other day. That was their move. Congrats, Kansas City. <laughs> um, you think so? You like Longoria as a potential? He's another one that you think could be. A good I love that, up. honestly. Team leader for any team, right? Yeah, I love it. Uh, so he's out there. David Peralta, he's a good player. He's out there. Johnny Cueto. Would you like him back with the Reds? I'd love it. That's what the rumor is. Yeah. That was last week, and he he's coming off a really good year. He was yeah. really good in a hitter's park last year, so I think that's a good one. I mean, if we're going to take a veteran flyer, I, I don't really know anyone else that I'd rather go for. Yeah. Um, and, like, yeah, like, I like seeing these guys come back at the end of their career, so that's, that adds to it. Like, yeah. I'd love to see Longoria go back. What do you think the market's like for Gene Segura? Two years, eighteen minute, eighteen million or something. Really? You think it's that low? I mean, something else I think is interesting is a big concern at the uh, MLB PA in the union, uh, all that stuff last year. The labor negotiations was that a lot of veteran players felt like mid-level players were kind of getting phased out of the game early. Um, this offseason, we've seen a lot of guys like Brandon Jury, uh, Jordan Lyles. Um, I have to think of some others, but there are a lot of – I've seen Ross Stripling. Like a lot of these guys are in their early to mid-30s who are getting those two-year deals where they're making like $10 million a year. So Yeah, very good deals. Very so good that's deals. good. Cause that was like, I know a lot of people were saying like these guys were not, were getting kind of phased out. Like Brandon Phillips, he was kind of out of the game a little early felt like. Yeah. I mean, that's also kind of his fault for <laughs> being outspoken, but <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, is there anything else that we need to get to uh baseball? Oh, how about Eovaldi? Eh. He might be a Dodger. That kind yeah. of feels like. Bring him back to the Dodgers. I could see him falling into this like Italian Walker category, though. Mm. If the right deal, I mean, I'd try to get yeah. him on a one year, not a three yeah. or four. Yeah, that I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I could see him going back. I could see him in San Diego. Um, they need another pitcher in their rotation. I mean, right now. Oh yeah, that was interesting. Seth Lugo is going to be a starter now. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. The uh reminds me of CJ Wilson. Wasn't he one of those guys who was a closer who became a starter kind of later in his career? Yeah. Um so all right, well, I, I don't think there's anything else, do you? I'm good. All right, so that's your wrap up on MLB Hot Stove up through the twenty second of December twenty twenty two. I'm hoping that we get some trades over the next couple of weeks. I think Jerry Depoto, it feels like there's a Jerry Depoto trade waiting to be made. He's always shaking things up. He likes to get those trades done before the end, before the start of the new year. Um, so we'll see about that. Brian Reynolds, is he moving? Uh, what else could be out there? Jorge Mateo, maybe Willie Adamas, maybe some of these brewers. Um, it's going to be very interesting to look out for. So, if we get some major news, which we certainly did a couple days ago, we were not prepared for that, then we'll be providing you another one of these podcasts sometime soon in terms of baseball. Um, but it looks like for the next couple weeks, we're probably going to do a little football stuff because we got the college football playoff coming up. Um, so we'll be providing you some coverage on, uh, on, their, on this show as well. And then be on the lookout for some more reality TV stuff in January. I'm going to try to fit a bunch of podcasts in before I hopefully venture out to spring training in February. So January should be a good podcast month because otherwise I'm going to be a little bored around here with no sun. So, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for your time today, pal. Absolutely. Thank you so oh, much for having me. We got to do some college basketball stuff. That's right. We need to do some college hoop stuff in January probably too. Uh, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so be on the lookout for all that stuff. Make sure you guys all subscribe to the Jack Vita Show so you don't miss out on future content. Like I said, be back next week, probably with some more college football stuff. 
Um, probably a preview of the college football playoff. We're going to probably do, talk to Stephanie again sometime soon. She's got a new show coming out. Um, so make sure you guys all subscribe to the Jack Vita show, Apple podcast, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, wherever it is that you are listening to this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. And until then I'm Jack Vita bringing the dance to the lobsters. <laughs>